I first really want to do is address a very serious issue at the start of this talk, and that is obviously this rather ridiculous jacket. Um, <laughs> partly because it's a little bit distracting, uh, but partly because I think it rather neatly captures a concept which I'll be talking about throughout the rest of the talk. So as you can see, it, it's a lab coat. So I guess that may conjure in your mind some image of uh, medicalism, research, academia, these sort of serious uh, academic things. And at the same time, it has this sort of silly collar. It's got the black villain splash thing in the middle. And so it's a little bit different. It's a little bit eye-catching. But it's based around a familiar and academic uh, concept. And I guess that's the concept I'll be talking about today, because I'll be telling you guys a bit about uh, gamification or game-based learning, uh, but particularly as it relates to a higher level of education. So higher education, particularly uh, medical training, but generally uh, university training as well. And hopefully along the way, um, you know, I'll banish some of the myths that you've come to grow with, with uh, game-based learning, and also I'll hopefully scare you a little bit. It's a little bit of a scary talk. So. <laughs> Just to introduce myself briefly, um, as they've already given me the big introduction, um, I come from a very boring background. I'm a sort of doctor, interested in science, like all those things, and nothing particularly special and interesting in that regard. And I also really like games. So this is this month's selection. This slide is obviously always very different depending on what I've done. Um, you know, I enjoy both board games, video games, strategy games. I play all sorts of games, and I really enjoy them. But the reason I got into making game-based learning for students is not because I think it's really fun and I, I heart games and I really enjoy them. It's because I actually think there is a fundamental underlying structural overlap between what you do during a game and what you do or what you should be doing during education. And I've been told the best way to illustrate things is with a joke. And so I'm going to take our first speaker's advice and do a little bit of a local joke, just to explain what I mean by the underlying structure. OK, so this is, are you guys ready? This is a local Hong Kong style joke. How does a bear say wife in Cantonese? It's like this. OK, good. So no one laughing. Good. That's exactly what I expect. This is sort of a, a few giggles of anticipation. Uh, someone sat on something over there. But uh, essentially, no laughter. Let me just explain why this is funny or could be funny. OK, so Cantonese wife is known as lao paw. OK, we say lao paw, right? And if a bear, this is a bear, these are his paws. This would be the high paw, and therefore this would be the lao paw, right? So this is, wow, you actually laughed. I didn't, I didn't. Uh, I didn't actually build that into the talk. I wasn't expecting anyone to laugh. But fine, you've laughed. That's fine. Um, more important than the joke is the fundamental structure of this joke. OK, so really, it's based on a very simple principle. We have two words that sound very similar. Uh, it's low poor and low poor. And when you combine them in any kind of combination, you can create humor. And the important thing is this is a structure. So you can actually use this concept whenever there are two words that sound the same. And I do this all the time, much to the pain of my wife who's watching. You know, I make jokes like this all the time because it's based on a single structure. This is very true of games, too. So whenever you're playing a game, um, they may have a totally silly content. It may be about camel racing, space, football, strategy, whatever it is. Uh, the content's not so important. It's the fundamental mechanics, which I think are most interesting. So I'm going to talk now about the fundamental mechanics of an escape room. Now, has any of you guys played an escape room before? A few of you guys? Yeah, also, quite a, quite a few players around here. So essentially what it is, is people, you'll be locked in a room with a team of participants. And in order to escape the room, you'll have to solve a series of challenges. And this can involve finding clues and solving a puzzle that give you another clue. And then you eventually have to sort of escape um, uh, doing all of these puzzles. And it's tremendous fun. And it's all very interesting. Um, but when I first played an escape room, I looked at the underlying structure. And what I found is it's really fascinatingly similar to what I want to recreate in the classroom or in a lecture hall or in any form of education. So what you do is you run around solving these mental puzzles. You're thinking all the time. You're trying to recall information. You're looking for patterns in data. You're communicating ideas with your colleagues and debating and arguing and possibly hitting them. Uh, you're working under pressure. You're having some limited time period. It's very, very similar to an exam. It's very similar to studying. There's only one major difference, and that is it's junk data. So the data, the problems that you solve have no meaning. It's sort of, uh, I have five wires that's red, blue, and brown, black, orange, and if you line them up correctly, it gives you a number, and that number makes you open a code. So that sequence has no real meaning. It's just junk, and you just solve it. 
Uh, but in my work, I see these patterns all the time. And these are patterns of how the arterial system in the thorax is arranged. It's, a, it's another similar pattern, but it just looks in a different way. And then the endings of drugs based on systematic functions of you know, what they do. This is another pattern. So what I wanted to do is develop this concept and use core content rather than junk data to do a very similar thing. Now, I promise you it's going to be a bit of a scary talk. I've got three very scary slides for you. Here we go. Are you ready? This is the first one. <laughs> Please don't read it. It's, it's horrendously. Uh, I, I don't really intend you to read it. I just want to give you an idea of the content, how we develop the content. So with the escape room that we did, I focused on the cardiovascular system. And these are the various subtopics. Uh, don't read the detail, but essentially anatomy, physiology, the function of the body, the drugs that you use, and the diseases and things like that. So essentially, we, we settle on the content first. It's the most boring part. In fact, if any of you think designing games is super fun, you're wrong. We start with the most boring stuff. And then the fun is sort of a very, very thin layer of icing on the top there. So as you can see, we have these uh, concepts, and then we build them into different challenges, you know, recall challenges, data interpretation, pattern, and problem solving. This sounds all very theoretical. And I know it's Sunday, Saturday morning in a university, so I'm going to scare you again with an even scarier slide. Are you ready? Ooh. Now, this is scary not because it's written in sort of red blood uh, writing. It's scary because it's a list of all the drugs uh, medical students will need to know for the cardiovascular system. So you need to know all the drugs, all the functions, what they do and how they interact. Okay, so this is a scary list for particularly for medical students, but uh, anyone, you know, you should be quite horrified by this list. So this is something that we developed to give you an example of one of the questions that we did. So we lined this up as a big post at the back of the wall and the question says, a, B, C, D plus A, R, B of antihypertensives. Okay, I'm not going to give you a medical lecture, although that's slightly what I'm used to doing. I just want you to guys to see what on earth you would do with that question. You're given that question, you've got this big thing. I'll give you a little bit of a clue. Um, a, B, C, D of antihypertensives, they're just classes of different drugs, okay, and they all have very particular endings. So here's the key to this puzzle. Uh, they all have familiar endings. I'm going to tell you that the first one, A, it stands for ACE inhibitor, the ending is P-R-I-L, PRIL. Okay, so that's a type of drug. Can anyone, I'm going to give you like a, a few seconds just to look at the list and see if there's any patterns emerging. I'll be honest with you, the students took ages for this, so I'm going to kind of skip ahead and just give you the live demonstration. So this is the solution to this particular puzzle. May I just demonstrate? Can you see where the prills, enalapril, captopril, asinopril, perindopril, rambopril, bentopril, quinalapril, and trendolopril, you can see they form a shape that looks a little bit like a 5 or an S. Okay, so that's one of the types of drugs. We then have the other types, like the beta blockers, which would be B, and you can see they're forming a line there. C would be the calcium channel blockers, and they form an X. D would be a diuretic, so they form a T and a Y. So this is what you get. So this is 60. So the answer to this puzzle is 60, and you need to enter it into a device, and it gets you the next clue. Now, you're all looking exactly how I'd like you to look, absolutely horrified, thinking, oh, my God, this is terrible. And this is why I enjoyed creating these game-based learning devices so much, because this is what our students did as well. They, they, they sort of looked like you, and they looked at each other and said, I don't know what we're supposed to do with this, uh, but I can identify some of the drugs. And the main thing that we got from this is they would get really clever people standing around looking at this puzzle saying, well, I'm not sure, but I know this one does this. I know Ramapril is kind of similar, and they slowly work out what's going on with the puzzle, all the while discussing fundamental things that they need to know. They need to know the drug functions. They need to know the names and how to identify them, and that's what we get them to do. And the most beautiful thing is if someone were to give me this list on a piece of paper, I would never treat it in that way. I'd never sit there going, oh, I really need to know this. Hey, 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 do you know this? Is it going to be like this? Can I ask you a question? Can we debate this? You'd never really get that. So this is really what we tried to recreate in the escape room. This is one example of the puzzles that we try to get to stimulate the students' thinking. Now, this, again, is the third horrific slide. Um, Really, just to give you an idea, that's one of the seven puzzles that we created. And we used a number of kind of uh, uh, interesting tools and devices to create different puzzles based on the different curricular materials. So we'd use uh, ultraviolet light to hide things. We'd use you know, real torso models and, and, and things like that. So from the academic design to the, the creative design, so really, once the puzzles are set, and that took 95% of the work, we get to have a little bit of fun. 
Okay, so, so we had a little bit of theoretical design. I think the, the, the picture kind of looks a little bit like me. He's done quite a good job with that. Again, if I may draw your attention, please, to the wordplay or your escape. Uh, yeah, that's good. That's not my joke. That was, that was the artist joke. And so we created a theme. I think as Marvel and DC Comics have shown us, uh, you can have any sort of silly storyline as long as people come. It's fine. So this was, I think, a crazy professor kidnaps students, locks them in the lab for some reason, and then makes them escape again for some reason. Um, so that was the story. And then, again, we have this part, again, that in that 5% of the fun bit, we have the physical design. So we actually built it from scratch in a real abandoned laboratory, we built in sort of trap doors, so when people open a puzzle, it opens a new other area into the game. It's kind of fun. But then again, you can see we use some fundamental things, a heart model, a torso model, that we'd normally use them to study on. And we have some cool gadgets as well. We have sort of the laser keyboard. We have the baby monitor, which is really nice, so you can talk to people. Uh, yeah, those who are parents will know. You can kind of scare them uh, using the baby monitor, and so on and so forth. So this is sort of the physical design. And we were very lucky to sort of be covered in the press. I, yeah, looks a bit like that. And you know, we had a lot of people come across. It was really just a local teaching uh, experiment. I don't know why it managed to reach a sort of really big audience. This is something we were doing randomly in the lab up at Hong Kong U. And we actually had some CUHK people come all the way across the pond uh, to visit us. And we had lots of random people. And we even had people contacting us saying, can we buy tickets? Or how, where's the online booking form? And that was really weird. Uh, but really nice as well. I think it was, it was sort of great to get that impact. Just a few of the metrics, um, you know, we had about 220 participants um, scared their way through. We had some funding from uh, uh, the Hong Kong University. And I was delighted to see that average completion time was 56 minutes, and we set them an hour to do this. Now, this is delightful for me because it means we've calibrated the difficulty almost just nicely. Because if they're finishing in 20 minutes, you know, there'll be a lot of blaming and a lot of uh, upsetness. And if none of them finish, it'll be terrible as well. I want to discuss very briefly some of the outcome metrics that we had from this, because it is an experiment. We want to see really whether it works. This is the very traditional, really lame feedback form. Do you think you learned? Did you like it? Yes, 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 fine. That doesn't show us anything. I think the interesting thing that we did this time is, can you see these two photos here? Can you see the perspective they're taken from? So actually what we did is we strapped a GoPro camera to our student's chest. And we recorded all of their actions, all of their movements, all of their discussion as they walked around the room. And then we plugged this video data into some pretty sophisticated qualitative analysis software known as Envivo. And what we can do with all of this video data is actually we can build up a decision tree at every single junction for the students. So if you imagine what that shows you about a student, unlike an exam, in an exam you get it right or wrong and that's it. But in this kind of setup, we can see, OK, how many people get it right? Basic metric. And then we can see what happens when they fail, what happens when they get it wrong. And this is a safe environment. You know, for medical people, we don't like them to fail in the hospital. But in the classroom, it's great. So we can see, OK, I failed, so I'm going to discuss another valve. I'm going to bring in an idea. I'm going to, I'm going to reframe the question. And some of them, and happily very few, would resort to sort of random guessing and fiddling with the lock and things like that. A few, but not very many. So this is kind of one of the key outcome measures that we found from our game is really we can map the brain process, the decision-making process of our students as they undergo challenges and, in a sense, see a little bit into their own minds. So there are two myths about game-based learning that I sort of want to finish on. This is the one, one of two which really annoys me. As a game-based learning enthusiast, a lot of people come up to me and say, ah, you're the guy, you make learning easier. No, that's really definitely not what I do. And I think it's really important that I should emphasize why that's the case. Learning is not about sort of sitting there having fun, relaxing at the spa, pina colada, putting your feet up. It's actually about effortful, deliberate process of learning. And so when people say, oh, it's a game, so it must be fun, so it must be very easy, I think that's totally the opposite of what we're doing. If you ever come to one of my classes, you'll be worked out hard. I mean, if your brain could sweat, which you can't, you would be sweating extremely hard. Because we are gonna, we're going to sit you there, and we're going to work you out hard for the whole hour. The beauty of game-based learning is not that it's easy, it's that you get people to do it themselves. These people do the hard work themselves. You don't have to sit there and say, hey, do some work. They will do it automatically. So that is the beauty of it, but it's not about making things easier in some way. You know, we're actually going to work you out really hard. And that's what I think should be a fundamental principle of game-based learning. And the second thing, this is another thing. A lot of people come up to me and say, well, it's a game, so it automatically is fun. Game equals fun. Ding. And I really dislike that. And that's just because I play loads of games. 
And they are some terrible, I mean, honestly, there are some terrible games out there. There are also some wonderful games and some medium games. But I think this concept that a game is always intrinsically good, it's just not true. There are terrible game designers. There are people who just have no idea what they're doing. There are people who don't like games but think it's a good idea and then do it. So there's a real spectrum of games out there. And I think this second thing, that games are always fun, always better than a lecture. I'm aware this ironic I'm kind of doing a lecture now, but, you know, it's... Um, there's certainly this thing about games that are not always, always fun. It depends a lot on a lot of moving parts, and I think people need to pay attention to the detail and not just the fact that it's a game. So I suppose in conclusion then, when I think about gamification for higher education and where we can go with this, I think the one take-home message I have for you is really looking at the structure. I don't come at you for an angle of fun and inspiration and wonderful. I have a really boring take. I look, take a game, I look at the underlying structure and mechanics, and then make it learning. I mean, that is a really boring message. Compared to some of the wonderful, inspirational people that we've seen around today, that's a really boring process. But I hope that some of you can look at the fundamental mechanics and structure of your hobbies, your interests and things, and if you're interested in creative education or creativity in general, you can extract something really valuable from just looking at this underlying structure. Thank you very much.